This week on Quadriga, Modified India, the new superpower? On his first visit to Europe since winning elections a year ago, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi emphasized his ambitious plans for his country. India's population and economy are already growing faster than neighboring China, but it remains a country of deep disparities. Modi says he wants to change that along with the country's image. Will he be able to turn the world's biggest democracy into a global economic powerhouse with stronger ties to Germany and Europe? Your host this week, Peter Craven. Yes, hello and a very warm welcome to this latest edition of Quadriga, the international talk show coming to you from Berlin. And the question we are addressing this week is, can India, under the leadership of Prime Minister Modi, harness its huge potential and its almost unlimited human resources to become a global superpower? And to answer that question, I'm joined here in the studio by three excellent commentators and observers. Welcome to all of you. I'd like to introduce them without any further ado, uh, beginning with Thomas Matuzek, the former German ambassador to India, where he served between 2009 and 2011. He's currently the managing director of the Alfred Herrhausen Society, which is Deutsche Bank's international forum. We're also joined by Christian Wagner. He is with the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, where he is head of research for Asia. India is just one of his many areas of expertise. And our trio is completed by Ramesh Jalra, who can look back on a distinguished career in journalism covering nearly five decades. He specialized on European perspectives on India and Indian perspectives on Europe. And he's an expert on intercultural communication, globalization and international development cooperation. And Ramesh Jalra, I'd like to begin with you. Because Mr. Modi, the Indian Prime Minister, has just been in Germany, been here in Berlin. It was a three-day visit. Uh, and I'd like to ask you what your impressions were of the visit. Well, I had the opportunity to meet him at an event organized by the Indian Embassy. And also listen to his speech, which was primarily in Hindi, a major Indian language. Mm -hmm. I was one of those who was very skeptical about uh, Modi before he was elected. But I must admit that he is an inspiring personality. He is a good political orator. The question now is how far can he deliver what he has promised? The main plank was developmental issues to bring India forward, to give people jobs. The fact that he speaks in Hindi, he comes from the lower middle class and that he has a, an impressive sense of humor. Sense of humor? Sense of humor, And yes. was that communicated during this visit oh, here yes, in yes, Germany? Yes, yes, yes. It endears him to lots of people. Mm -hmm. This is the public face of Modi. I don't know his private face. Uh -huh. Not many people do, do they? Yeah? We don't know much about the, about the man uh, as a private individual. Well, if I had had the opportunity to interview him, then I would have known a little bit more mm -hmm. about him, the private face. But that was not possible because he doesn't like to give interviews mm -hmm. unless he decides whom he wants to give an interview. OK. Some fascinating initial insights there. Thomas Matasek, what was your impression of this, uh, of this very important visit by the, uh, the Indian leader to Germany? Well, I think uh, that he has achieved what he set out to do, to present a new dynamism of India to a German audience, especially a German business audience, who has become a little wary of India because of a number of obstacles they have encountered over the years, such as increasingly red tape, mm -hmm. such as um, endemic corruption, such as, um, for instance, retroactive taxation, all these sorts of things. Uh, and even, let's say, companies who had been in India for decades in the end lost a little bit of their patience. And Modi uh, managed to create 
a new psychological atmosphere where he um, gave new hope to um, the Germans, to German companies, who after all employ about half a million people throughout India. And uh, I think uh, in that sense the visit was successful. So Mr. Modi was trying to create an atmosphere of new hope, a sense of new hope, and were German investors buying into that? Um, yes, I think they were waiting uh, for something like that to happen because uh, they remember that Modi was elected with an impressive majority. Here you had somebody who for the first time in decades was not dependent on very complicated coalitions. That's a good then, point. Then yeah. knew Modi from his time as um, Prime Minister of Gujarat, mm -hmm. where German companies had made very, very good experiences. And everybody in India and beyond was crying out for the strong man, the iron hand, who really could rip through that thicket of, um, as I said, uh, red tape, bureaucracy, long procedures, etc. And I think that was very important because I think, as Ludwig Erhard said, 50% of the economy is psychology. Former German Chancellor Ludwig Erhard. Yeah? Absolutely. Yeah, Great yeah. stuff. Okay. Um, Christian Wagner, I'd like to get your impressions of the visit and perhaps speci specifically with this question. Chancellor Merkel, Merkel and Prime Minister Modi spent quite a lot of time together during this visit. Did you have the sense that the two leaders have a good working relationship? Well, I think they uh, have established a very good uh, working relationship. India is also one of the few countries uh, which with Germany has government consultations, which we will we'll see later in, uh, in the year. So I think it was the first uh, meeting uh, of the um, heads of state uh, in order to establish their personal relationship. Mm -hmm. At the end, of course, it will all depend on how far, as has been mentioned, uh, Modi can deliver um, on the, on the numerous investments that have been made, one of the most important reforms he has pushed through so far was giving um, the states more uh, flexibility in India because at the end it's not the center who decides on the uh, development issues but it's more the states and the states will become uh, will get more freedom uh, and of course this will then be the most decisive point to see in how far all the promises of investment will uh, really materialize at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And Ramesh Shara, just to, just to round up on the, on the initial thoughts about this three-day visit by Mr. Modi, did you get a sense during the visit of what India has that Germany needs and what Germany has that India needs? Yes, uh, I think so. I think so. I mean, he used a very interesting expression, a strong partnership between the king of the earth, the lion, mm -hmm. and the king of the skies, the eagle, mm -hmm. saying that, and you know, India has this slogan of make in India, yeah. and this is being carried on the back of uh, a lion, a hologram of which was also presented at the Hanover Fair. Now, I think for, for, um, for for, for ages, I would say, particularly since the independence of India and uh, uh, the end of the last world war, India and Germany have had very close relations mm -hmm. on different levels, political, economic, cultural. There have been some strains and stresses in these relations, uh, not the least also because of uh, the emergency which was declared by Indira Gandhi, then the prime minister, then, but India proved that it is a sound, solid democracy. Mm -hmm. And you can see also the, the, the thumping majority that Modi got in the last elections, that there has been no bloodshed, there have not been any kind of questions raised. Has he really been elected? Does he, did he deserve it? People have accepted him. And but there's the other part of the story, and that is that the opposition is reduced to more or less zero. Mm -hmm. And this is not something good for democracy. When India became independent, the Congress party was uh, leading and in power, and there was no opposition. The then Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, he said a strong democracy needs a strong opposition. Mm -hmm. So he encouraged the opposition parties. He gave them more time to talk in the parliament than they deserved. So I think Modi faces a lot of challenges. And the Indo-German relations, 
also face a lot of challenges because there are always ups and downs in the history of any country because mm -hmm. times keep on changing. To what, expect, to, to what extent Germany, not only political official Germany, but also the media and the businessmen would have patience and would have the sustainability to steer through whatever crisis might come. Mm. Okay, so can, we... I, can I latch on to that? You asked uh, what does India need, what does Germany need? And I think we are in an interesting situation here that these two are totally complementary. You know, what India needs is renewal of its very bad infrastructure, rail, roads, harbors, airports, etc. What India needs is clean energy. What India needs is help in water management, etc. And what India needs most is a system of vocational training which brings these huge young labor force into, uh, into work. Because one of the advantages of India is that it has this huge labor force at a time when China is grappling with the secondary effects of the one-child policy, when the demographics in industrialized countries going down. So India has this human capital. But it's only a capital and not a millstone round your neck if you can bring them into work, into labor. And the German system of dual vocational training is practically the best we can offer. On the other hand, turning around, what Germany needs are the young brains, the software engineers. What Germany needs is this huge, unsaturated future market. What Germany needs are Germany the... Germany talks has been talking about for, for years about bringing in Indian software, yes. IT people. Uh, which, but, didn't but, work, it, which didn't uh, work. No. Well, it worked what, to a certain degree. It could have been better, but you remember the so-called a green card initiative, which yes, was a yes, misnomer yes. at the time. Yes, yes. So it helped to a certain degree, but we could do much, much more. Mm -hmm. And the usual uh, uh, excuse of the central government in Germany is, it's not our competence, it's the lender. Everybody agrees we need to do the something. Federal states. The federal states. <laughs> we need to do something about it, but progress here is very, very slow. I mm -hmm. agree. But we need them. <clears throat> we are in desperate need of a young workforce, a young educated workforce uh, which we can't create ourselves in the necessary degrees. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what you're talking about there about the nuts and bolts of economic cooperation. I'd just like to go back to, our, mm -hmm. to the initial question that we asked at the beginning of the show. Is India aspiring to be a superpower? Is India aspiring to be a superpower? Should India be aspiring to be a superpower? Well, um, since independence, India has always uh, aspired to be a superpower, to uh, have a greater role in world affairs. Mm -hmm. There is the constant quest for a permanent seat in the UN Security Council. Mm -hmm. Um, the build-up of the nuclear pro program has more to do with power pro uh, projection rather than with uh, security concerns. So there is a constant um, uh, uh, wish by, uh, by all Indian governments since 1947 um, to be also be recognized as one of the leading superpowers. Okay. What has what, what has missing so so <laughs> far has been the. Um, has been the uh, economic um, base, and this is what uh, Modi has clearly understood, that if you want to be counted in today's world as a superpower, you, ha you uh, have to build on a strong economic base. So uh, this is what, uh, this is his main plan. I would say that his foreign policy is to a great extent a continuation of its domestic policy, and that's all about uh, um, the economic development um, of India to cope uh, with China and to be treated on the same par and be in the same institutions like uh, uh, China is. Mm -hmm. I, I was so, sorry, I was uh, almost yeah. interrupting you there, but I, I, as a journalist, I'm very curious because it's, it's the kind of term that we use on a day-by-day -day basis as a journalist, the, the tag, a superpower, a nation is a superpower or not a superpower. What does it actually mean, this term, superpower? Well, su uh, superpower is probably m more a political rather than an analytical term. Uh, so we would say uh, if you are uh, in the uh, leading I uh, institutions, uh, which is, of course, the permanent seat in the UN Security Council, or if you would be a, a member of the uh, or an uh, atomic state in the uh, non-proliferation treaty. Uh, India has, of course, the uh, nuclear program, but it's not a member of the uh, 
NPT. So in this sense, I think um, one can link the status of a superpower also um, with the uh, linkage to global institutions. What of course is missing in India that of course you have the political will, but you lack both the uh, economic uh, structure, you also um, lack a lot of the uh, political structure. One should not forget that India only has a um, diplomatic core of about 900 diplomats, uh, which is about the size of Sing uh, Singapore. And in today's world of interdependence, where you have to deal with all kind of international uh, regimes and um, crises, this is definitely too less to play superpower games. So in this sense, the Indian government has, of course, uh, notice this problem. There are, of course, reforms to increase the number, but this will take time, and this, of course, is a much more important point, which also points to the uh, fact that you have to invest more in your uh, human capacities also then to become really a superpower on the global stage. Mm. I'd just like to ask you a, a follow-up question, not entirely playful. You presumably would say that Germany is not a superpower. Germany, we don't have the aspiration to be a superpower. We want to uh, be a, uh, an, an important player on the international uh, level, yes. Mm -hmm. We also have, uh, we are also cooperating with India in the G4 to have a reform uh, on the UN, but we have not uh, mentioned, the, uh, we have never, uh, over such a long period, since 1947, Germany has never uh, articulated its wish to become a permanent member in the Sec UN Security Council. This is a more recent uh, development, which of course is not the case uh, on the Indian side. Okay. Okay. But I wasn't asking that question entirely playfully, because what, what I was getting at is that uh, it, it, I think it's fair to say that, and we talked about this a little bit already, not just on the economic level, there's a commonality between Germany and India, because both are sort of second rank, but very influential nations. That's a status they share. Yes. Uh, I mean, we have, of course, a very different uh, audience. India has, um, has uh, invested a lot of its uh, resources in, um, in, the de in the developing world. So India has always been regarded as a representative of the developing countries, whereas Germany, of course, has always um, oriented its foreign policy much more in, into the European context or in the uh, Western context. So in that sense, we are both... Uh, important players in our respective communities, but of course we also share a lot of common concerns when it comes to uh, environmental issues or uh, to security issues. Okay. Well, I'll beg to differ that oh. uh, <laughs> so the <do> leaders <laughs> of uh, India have always aspired to be a superpower. Let's go back to the first Prime Minister of India, whom I mentioned earlier, Jawaharlal Nehru. The, the main emphasis of India immediately after independence was the non-aligned movement. And that movement was not striving to become a superpower. It's That's one thing. But if you look at the aspiration of India, we are talking a lot about uh, what, what Iran is really planning or what is not planning. India has always been against an NPT or any other treaty which is discriminatory. So India has built up its own nuclear reactors, partly with the help of uh, Canada and, and, uh, and Australia, but it has not been focusing its energy on being a superpower. For that, you need a big army. You need uh, an infrastructure, which India does not have. You need resources, which India does not have. This is one aspect of the whole issue. Now, could we say that the, how many superpowers do we have now since the Berlin Wall fell and the Soviet Union collapsed? We talk of only one superpower and that's the United States of America. Before that, we had Russia or the Soviet Union, which was also a superpower. But if you look really into the infrastructure of the Soviet Union that time, and if you look into the infrastructure of the United States today, does it really fulfill all the criteria of what we would call a superpower in the sense of economic stability, in the sense of uh, the, uh, not a big gap between the rich and the poor, uh, the, the ability to, to understand international relations, the standard of education, and, and, and whatever the basic necessities of life, you have to go to different parts of New York to see that that's not the case. 
So when we talk about the superpower, we are basically talking about how many internet, in, in, intercontinental missiles you have, how many nuclear bombs you manufacture. <clears throat> and the superpower, of course, the only superpower we know in that sense is the United States of America, which 70 years ago threw bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So if that is the criteria to have a bomb, then you can be a superpower. Unfortunately, unfortunately, this is the general belief that people have. But again, I would like to emphasize, it is not true, it is not a part of history, and it's not logical to say that India's leaders have always aspired to be a superpower. Okay. Thomas Matasek is well, itching we, as, to get in. <laughs> <laughs> as, as you see, the term superpower doesn't help us at all. It's a leftover of the Cold War. And we can argue till we're blue in the face who's a superpower and what not. What is much more important is today, um, it's not just the uh, quantity of tanks and rockets which define power. Uh, it's the economic strengths. And it is something which is sometimes under, uh, underestimated and which India has in abundance. It's soft power. Exactly. The attractiveness of a civilizational model the attractiveness of a culture, and here India is already very, very strong. Mm -hmm. Now, it depends a little bit on how India will develop. If India manages to bring its young labor force into actual productive work, to industrialize the country, and here as an aside, let me say, India managed to do something which is unparalleled. They practically leapfrog from the backward agricultural economy into the knowledge economy of the 21st century, jumping over the normal stage of industrialization. But you need industrialization to get people into work. So they're taking a step back. If that, if that works, then I would say India will probably one, be one in the future, one of the most important countries uh, of the world irrespective how many frigates or rockets or tanks they have. So I would, I'm, I'm hesitant using the term superpower because it, it doesn't tell you anything. India will, in, as far as its potential future strength is concerned, as far as its population is concerned, and as far as its attractiveness as a civilizational model is concerned, be one of the leading influences in tomorrow's world. And that's exactly what Modi is playing on. OK, then we'll continue. We've got two things, two big areas that we have to talk about. We have to talk about Mr Modi as a leader, Prime Minister Modi, and we also have to talk about the economic challenges he's facing uh, and the, the way he's going about... He's only been in office for, for, for less than a year. Uh, the way he's going about challenging those... Uh, uh, tackling those challenges. We've got this short report, and then we'll continue our conversation. Some of India's best-known sectors internationally are its IT companies and call centers. But powered by international investors, the country's economy is now also dramatically growing in areas like manufacturing and pharmaceuticals. But there are still plenty of significant hurdles. When it comes to being friendly to business, the World Bank currently ranks India very low on its comparative table. Part of the challenge is modernizing the country's ramshackle transport networks and industry without impacting badly on the environment. Another major problem is tackling widespread poverty. Many Indians lack access to basic necessities like electricity and clean drinking water. Child mortality is high. And there are still huge barriers to overcome in education. In many areas of the country, the caste system still plays a dominant role in society. The country's economy may be going strong, but many of its people have yet to see the benefits, especially people in rural areas and women. That's the point a little bit, that people have yet to see the benefits in many parts of India. Um, Christian Wagner, I w uh, th I'm a great admirer of the British economist Jim O'Neill. He's the man, as you will know, who coined the term the BRICS uh, for the leading emerging economies. And he has been quoted as saying that uh, Narendra Modi is good on economics. Yeah? How important is that, that he's good on economics? What are his credentials? What has he achieved so far? And how is he going to go about achieving more? I know you're an expert on all these things. <laughs> um, well, um, of course, it's all about... Uh, 
economy, um, and this is why Modi has been um, elected. So far, the reforms have, have not really been taken off. Uh, as I said, one of the most important reforms so, so far, there have been some reforms, um, more foreign di direct investment coming in for the insurance sector, also for the defense industry. What I think is a much more important reform is the greater flexibility for the states, because Modi, as a former chief minister, knows that uh, the jobs and uh, the and the development issues are in the competence of of uh, of the states, not of the centre. So we often forget that India is not only uh, the largest, uh, the biggest democracy; it's it's also the biggest fed, um, federal federalist system. And let me just come in, because we mentioned this already. He came from Gujarat already, and he got a lot of yes. credit back then yes. when he was in charge of Gujarat. And since then, for what he achieved back then, including, uh, you mentioned it, ger approval from German companies who, who invested there. W what did he get right in Gujarat back Gujarat, then? Gujarat uh, has on always been an economic uh, success story. Yes, it has never been a social success story. Mm. Uh, and as you have uh, seen in the report, uh, India still suffers under the social question you still have uh, literacy rates, uh, illiteracy rates which are relatively high compared to other Asian uh, countries. You still have enormous problems when you uh, uh, look at the health sector. Mm -hmm. India will not be able to achieve all the Millennium Development Goals. Um, so these are the uh, pressing problems for the people. So what Modi has to do is of course he has to deliver, but this of course, especially education and health are both under the uh, under the competence of the states. Uh, so this is why it's necessary to give the states more freedom, which will also increase the competition among the states, which will also increase the inequality among the states, yes. But at the end of, uh, uh, of the day, all the development successes can only be delivered on the state level, not on the uh, centre level. Mm. And is the fundamental problem, open question, going to remain that India is a country, and it has been for so long, where we've talked about the burgeoning middle class, we've talked about there are people in India who are wealthy, there are people who are ultra-wealthy, but people tend to be really blinkered about the, about the fate of the poor in India, and the fact remains that the, India has the greatest concentration of poverty in the world. Well, um, that's true. That's a huge problem. And there are, of course, different economic models. There is one uh, model which India, under Indiraji and uh, under later Congress um, uh, governments, favored that is a sort of uh, redistribution of wealth. I mean, anti poverty programs, etc. There are other models who say, well, we have to create a lot of wealth at the top and it somehow will trickle down. So where Modi will go, I don't know exactly yet, but uh, one thing is clear that India, if uh, whoever is in power, will develop from an agricultural country to a much more urban country. When I left India uh, the first time in the early 80s, 80% 80 of the population lived in the countryside. Now it's about uh, half and half, and in 20 years' time, 70% will live in cities. And that changes the whole equation. Another problem is there are large parts of the country, and here I mention the buzzword Naxalite, large parts of the country which are totally left behind, where the government kept out of, where law and order didn't exist, etc. explain for our viewers what, who, yeah, who the Naxalites you know, the, are? The, They've in, been around in, for a long time early, now, In they? the early 80s, there was a little Robin Hood-like Maoist resurrection in a small place called Naxalbari. And that has now spread over eight states and almost 200, uh, uh, 200 districts, meaning that there is a combination of residual Maoist, organized crime, illiter uh, illegal mining, etc., etc., where the poorest of the poor are being exploited and are being left behind, and that creates a sort of unrest which also became very, very violent. Mm -hmm. And the, the latest uh, Indian Prime Minister, Manwan Singh, once said, the greatest threat to the stability of India is not Pakistan, uh, it's an exilite movement. And this is a symptom for this growing gap between the rich and the poor. Mm -hmm. And unless Modi and the states cannot tackle that problem, it will always remain a huge risk, not just for the economy, but for the political stability of the country as a whole. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the size of the country and the population we have and the disparities which exist, income disparities, they are the super rich 
with the, the super poor. You know, so it's, it's a huge task that any government in India, whether at the central level or in the states, is faced with. As for the Millennium Development Goals are concerned, well, I think you can count probably on your fingers how many countries really have fulfilled the Millennium Development Goals. Mm -hmm. And we can also call into question as far as the, what the Millennium Development Goals are about and whether they were the right ones, because now we are moving towards sustainable development goals. That's what the United Nations will decide in September. I, I would think that you know, we, we saw a picture just now. You see, if you go around the United States and if you look only for what is lacking, the, the negative aspects of life, you will find them there. If you go to, uh, to, to Belgium, you will find them there. You go to France, you will find them there. You go to Italy, you will find them there. Mm. So it depends on where the camera goes and where it looks for. But as you yourself pointed out, the disparities in India are yes. very great. When yes. we talk about rich and poor, for yeah. example, when we talk about North and South India, yeah. they're almost two different countries these days, say many Indians themselves. I'd just like to talk about another division in India, yeah. which we haven't mentioned properly so far, and that is between Hindus and non-Hindus, because Mr Modi, of course, has a pedigree as a Hindu nationalist which is extremely problematic and presumably was part of your scepticism towards pain, Mr. Yeah. Modi. Yeah. Which is something I'm unhappy about because we know we are talking about, about the, what happened to some of the churches in, in, in India. We also know that there have, been, uh, uh, there have been very tense relations between India and Pakistan, on the other hand, between the Muslims in India and, and the Hindus in India. But I would again like to appeal to the fact Look at the size of India and look at, look at the fact that almost every religion in the world is represented in India. Mm. Now, you cannot expect a country as huge as that to have no problems at all. For me, one of the basic challenges that Modi is faced with is to prove to India, to the world, that India is a secular state and to strengthen the secular democracy in India, so that the kinds of incidents or accidents which ever happen in relations between the Hindus and the Muslims, Hindus and the Christians, Christians is something new, it has not been the case before. You're putting a very, very positive spin on this. I mean, I've just got, I've got one quote from a critic of Mr Modi saying that since he has been in power, there's been a resurgence, I'm quoting now, of militant, chauvinistic and violent Hindu nationalism. Well, Christian that, Wagner, let's, let's say, like, uh, I, mean, I mean, one should always keep in, keep in mind um, that India, you have 80% of Hindus, yes, which is some 800 million people, but Hinduism has never been a political force. So politically, India is a minority society. So, and this is what the BJP tried to to merge Hinduism or to transform the 80% Hindus into one bloc. This has never, this has not worked and it will not work. Even Mr. Modi, he has a strong majority, yes, but he was only elected by 31% of the vote. So one should not forget that you still have a very strong also Hindu secular segment uh, in the society. Of course, uh, Mr. Modi has to balance within the BJP um, those shop uh, chauvinistic groups uh, who are operating in different parts of the country which are creating problems with the minorities, yes. But um, he also has a very uh, liberal uh, segment in the BJP which wants to open up, which knows that the kind of minority problems will, have, uh, will be counterproductive for India's economic de development as well. So in this sense, I, th I would say um, Modi has also not mentioned um, or has not played the communal card, as it is called in India, in, the, in his election campaign. His election campaign was all about development, development for all. One, I would say, positive aspect is Modi's approach towards women. He mentioned in his speech to, uh, on Independence Day that the problems of rapes is not a problem of the women, it's a problem of the sons which I think in a conservative Hindu society is a very liberal view. So in this sense, I think Mr. Modi will face a continuous challenge to, uh, throughout his whole 
tenure to somehow manage those fringe groups um, in the BJP or in uh, Hindu uh, nationalist um, or right-wing groups, um, that we will not see large-scale rights. We will never be able to really have a full control, yes, but I think he's pretty much aware that this will be one of the most difficult uh, domestic challenges. Thomas Matasek, give, us, give yeah. us your short take okay. on this one, because uh, we've got I, I ground to cover now. Yes, okay. Um, I hate to be the spoiler, uh, but as uh, both uh, um, personalities here um, highlighted the positive side, let me say, let me say this. Um, Modi has to prove that he is a different Modi from the Modi in Gujarat and the anti-Muslim riots. So he said a number of very good things that he'd rather build a thousand toilets than a thousand temples, etc. But it remains a fact that large parts of his party and the militant wing RSS say and do very unappetizing things. So the question is, to what degree is Modi willing and to what degree can he keep the party as a whole on this laicistic central course? For the time being, nobody dares to challenge Modi. But what if the, the gloss wears off? Will he then be able to keep his people in reign? What if we have an Islamist terrorist attack? Will he then be able to hold back the hotheads of his party who will demand a, a counter reaction to some, I don't know, a terrorist base in Pakistan? Things like that. We have to keep that in mind and Modi really and this is very, very important, has to rein in these elements in the party if he wants to be credible. OK. I'd like to just move the discussion into a different direction because I think it's an important aspect of what we're talking about today. The pundits like to talk about the battle of the systems between China and India. If there is a battle of the systems, and I think it is, it is in large measure true, who is winning that battle? Well, I mean, uh, as we all come, I would uh, uh, assume, from the uh, 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 enlightenment, uh, uh, human rights, democracy, market economy camp, I would say, in the long run, democracy, respect for rule of law, human rights, uh, dis uh, a distribution of power, market economy will win. Uh, I cannot prove it until now, but uh, uh, I believe that you cannot have a good economic development where the state decides on, uh, uh, on the markets. So I'm quite positive that in the medium and long term, the Indian system will prove superior. Um, democracy, a democratic system um, can be in certain respects uh, a weakness of a country because you have to go through different uh, decision-making processes but that's where the strength of India lies. And back in the 80s, there were, there were a lot of criticism about India, uh, that India does not take decisions, that the businessman would complain. This is not happening, whereas you could go to China and do everything possible. But I think, on the whole, even the business community is realizing that it is not enough to have a political leadership in a country which decides this way or that way, but to also have a sustainable system where you can look forward to a fruitful cooperation in the coming years. And that's what Modi has been trying to bring in during his visits to France, to Germany, and now to Canada. Christian Wagner, is it the Indian elephant or the, uh, or the Chinese dragon? For me, it's also in the long term the Indian elephant. Why? China has already a globalized economy, yes, but faces enormous political problems to cope with all the domestic challenges. Uh, India has, uh, is facing um, um, an opposite dilemma. India uh, has to globalize its economy. Yes, this will create enormous problems, but uh, India is already fit uh, to deal with all the political challenges because for over 60 years, India is facing all the kind of minority conflict, social questions, and they have developed a very strong institutional setting despite all the problems that we have. This so this will give the Indian system in the long term a much greater stability uh, also to improve its uh, economic um, development. Okay. 
One question that we have touched on, because we began by talking about Germany and India and the relations between the two countries politically and economically. Uh, I'd just like to go back to a point that you mentioned, the aspirations of both countries, you have to say, uh, especially India, for a seat on the UN Security Council, a permanent seat. Uh, are either, is, is either of the countries going get, to get a permanent seat in the foreseeable future? Mr Modi, certainly when he was here in Germany, made it very clear that that is still his goal. A quick take from each of you, if possible. I spent hundreds of quality hours of my life in negotiating this as UN ambassador. Uh, I would say it's absolutely indispensable that India gets a permanent seat in the Security Council. About Germany, I personally am not so keen on it. We have too many Europeans as permanent members anyway. So in the long run, India has to be there, an African country has to be there, Latin America has to be there. Okay. Exactly. I would fully agree with him. And I, and I think that um, India is striving for it in a very diplomatic way. Mm -hmm. It's not being aggressive about it. Modi has again brought up this issue, which, and he says India deserves it. Take the, the participation of India in peacemaking, uh, in peacemaking um, uh, operations of the United mm -hmm. Nations mm -hmm. and its contributions to the entire United Nations system. The fact, if you go back to history, um, it was India which pleaded for China to be a member of the UN Security Council. India did not aspire at that point in time. It is high time now that India gets that seat. Even the Chinese uh, foreign ministry spokesman has given a hint. They, well, they are quite sympathetic, this, this kind of thing, but that is diplomacy in any case. Uh, but it's, it, the decision does not lie with India. The decision lies with the P5. Okay, a quick take from Christian Wagner on the same question. I, we... I do not see a reform in the foreseeable future, but I think we see new institutions like the G20 which will um, deal with global affairs and in which India has its rightful place. Okay, thank you very much for that. Thank you very much all three uh, for joining me here in the studio today. We've been discussing uh, the prospect of India harnessing all its economic potential, India possibly becoming a superpower, a global superpower, possibly getting a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. Uh, I hope we've given you plenty of food for thought. Thanks very much for joining us and do come back next week. Until then, bye-bye uh, and truce. <laughs>